that when 42, 44 artists that were working here this week leave on Friday, they're leaving and they're, they're going away with some very, very special experience that they just had here. So that is really, for me, um, the reason of, of doing this whole thing and making sure that we're turning out great artists and making great art in the world. That's our, that's our, whole, uh, our whole goal here. So big round of applause for yourselves for doing that, of course. So the process of this starts about November-ish um, when we start kind of vetting and looking for artists. So we ask our students here, and um, those of you that are from out of town, put your hands up, because there's quite a few people that came from different locations this year. Where are you from? Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Who else had their hand up? Dayton. 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 Cincinnati. Cincinnati. Anybody else? We have Overland, and we have some folks um, that are not here tonight, but from uh, New York and from also uh, um, uh, Boston area. So uh, this is really turning into what we always wanted it to be, which is a destination for people to come and learn about art, because this is this this facility is so special. Uh, it, it is run by the Recreation and Parks Department. The City of Columbus here um, is, is the reason that we're able to uh, keep the costs very manageable and also provide just an unmagnificent uh, studio experience. So uh, your tax dollars if you're living here at work right now, so we're, we're super proud of that. Um, we have to thank, and I don't believe there's anybody here from our Friends of the Cultural Arts Center group, it's our 501c3 group that uh, raises funds throughout, this, throughout the year. Um, they manage a lot of the additional funds that the city uh, does not, which allows us to do uh, exactly what we're doing here this week. So we big round of applause for the Friends of the Cultural Arts Center. They do great work through the whole year. Um, also, want to thank uh, Jeff Martin, our director, who's back here in the back. He's eating pizza. He's uh, so he's the one that, that manages everything that goes on here and uh, keeps the, the ship upright uh, as it is. And then, of course, Eric Rausch, uh, right over here, instructor. And just to get a, just a real quick history. Uh, this facility, for those of you that aren't here, we have about 750 students that come to classes here each week. And that is an enormous amount of, of uh, resources that we need to pull together and our, and our instructors are top notch. Uh, the, again, the facility here rivals any university uh, facility around. I, I truly believe that. Uh, so we're, we're really lucky. Everybody. Um, says that this is the best kept secret. Well, we're not trying to keep it a secret. We're trying to let people know about it. And, and the wall that goes around the building here was meant to keep people out. We're always trying to bring people in. So uh, that's our job over here. I'm going to turn this over to Eric because he's going to introduce the artists that have been here this week. And again, thank you all for being here. It's, I'm so fortunate to be able to go around and speak with, with some of you and see what's been going on. And, unbelievably impressed and each year I say wow this year is better even than last year so thank you very much everybody does feel like the best year but we say that to every year because it just is such a great week when we're here and I was walking around feeling the same thing as Todd trying to always to practice living in the moment and being grateful of what's around us and I mean, it's almost overwhelming, and then when the talent, extra talent comes in here, and the, the students who are here already taking advantage, get to experience things that you might have to travel to a, a Pentland or a Haystack, if you know what I'm talking about, these craft schools where you do these intensive learning. That was always the idea behind this week, and this is our fifth year, right, Todd? Fifth yeah. year? And it really feels like it's gel, and we're excited for next year, for sure. Um, I would like to thank Todd Camp. Can we please give him a little round of applause? And really, uh, me being the coordinator this year came about sort of towards the end of last year. It's been Todd's baby for the last four years. 
uh, a little history. The, the first year that it started, I started coordinating it and had to step away and Todd took over. So he, he took it up right from where I had left it off the first year and then he ran with it. We worked together again this year. And, and on that note, I'd like to thank Jeff and the entire Cultural Arts Center administration and staff for making this pull off. So if you could do one more applause. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you know, you know it's important to me when I put on the banana shirt, so I dress up pretty well. Um, I'm sure I have a lot more to ramble on, but I'm going to cut myself off right here. And um, I am not going to go too long on the introduction for our first artist to, to speak, Sarah Sedwick. Traveled here from Oregon. She's in Ohio originally, but has transplanted her roots out west, where she is finding her little piece of heaven out there. So. Um, the one thing, I was introduced to Sarah through the process um, of having people sign up for the class, and you can tell right away, and I told her when she got here, whatever she's doing, she's doing right, because people were very excited to take the class, and all week it's just been the greatest energy in her studio. So thank you, Sarah, and please come up and share with us. <laughs> Sergeant. Those colors are cad, red, yellow, ochre, and 
ivory black is the blue in that primary set. Anyway, it works very well for flesh tones. And I teach portrait painting from life with that palette. It's a lot of fun. The one thing all my workshops have in common, though, is that we paint from direct observation. No one ever works from photos in my classes. Some people try to use their cameras as a viewfinder, you know, and I let them get away with it a little bit. But at a certain point, it's, you no, know, put the camera down, look at the still life. So, those of you who are students in the other workshops this week, come up and check us out tomorrow. You'll see we've got lots of fruit. <laughs> so, a little bit about me. I mentioned that I grew up in Cleveland. Here I am in my, uh, my first studio. I call this my lying down period. I was really into marker back then. And here's a shot from my first solo show. You see, my, my signature was really big in the 80s. <laughs> it's gotten a little smaller since then. You'll see that coming up here. But I was lucky to have uh, access to uh, art classes for high school students at the Cleveland Institute of Art when I was a high schooler, and I had a great art teacher in high school as well. So if I have any uh, current or retired high school art educators, my hat's off to you. There wouldn't be people like me without people like you. I did this in a painting class at the CIA. I believe this is one of the only accrued is one of two acrylic paintings by me that exist. And then I made one of the best, hardest and best decisions of my life, which was to go to a traditional art school instead of maybe a regular university's art department or just a regular university for kind of a general education degree. I did decide to attend Maryland Institute College of Art that's in Baltimore. It's a fantastic school. And I was an illustration major. This is an example of an assignment I had for my major that was illustrate a still life. And you can see the kind of stuff I was into back then. <laughs> and here's some of the other stuff I was into back then. But no, really, I was exposed to a lot of famous artists. We were told to look at a lot of art when I was in art school. And back then, it, that was you go to the library, you get a big book down from the shelf, and you look through it. And now it's click, 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 and we can see everything at our fingertips. But back then, I found artists like Alice Neal and John Singer Sargent, and I fell in love with portrait painting, and I wanted wanted so much to be a portrait portrait painter. And then I graduated from art school, so they thought us were cute berets. And then what happened? So, I got out of art school and I had a little trouble getting started on my art career. God bless Micah, they tried to prepare us to get out of school and have these careers. And I thought as an illustration major that I would have work waiting for me when I graduated with my BFA. But that was not really the case. I got, uh, I picked up some ideas that were not really helpful to me in beginning my career as a professional artist in art school. Some of those were uh, to be worth anything, a painting had to be really large and maybe it had to be figurative, and maybe a biblical narrative subject. And I just was so, at, oh, and the traditional gallery thing. You know, the internet was in its infancy. We're talking about 2001 here. Facebook barely existed. Social media, yeah, and marketing yourself as an illustrator back then looked like printing up a physical book of your work, mailing it out to art directors, going to New York City, and asking for work. And I was so intimidated, I just could not get started and I quit painting for several years. And you know, nowadays I have this opportunity to mentor artists online, but I mean, it's face-to-face. -face. We are using Zoom, which is kind of a Skype-type program. And I'm kind of life coaching, it's odd, but I get the opportunity to talk to people who are in the position that I was in 15, 20 years ago, where I could not figure out how to get myself to do the thing that I really wanted to do. Why am I not painting, you know? And I know the pain of not making the art feel like you were put here to make. That went on for more years than I like to admit, actually. And so around the time that I was 26, 27, <coughs> I discovered daily painting. I don't know how many of you have heard of daily painting, but it's a movement that got started amongst artists maybe 15 years ago or so through blogging. And blogging isn't a thing anymore, but it was the big social media thing back in uh, 2005 or so. I discovered these daily painters and became very inspired. The idea that a painting didn't have to have the weight of the world on it, that it didn't have to be a huge investment of time or materials, just set me free. And I was off and running with that. 
started a blog. This is my very first blog post from February 21st, 2008. Yeah. And I started doing daily painting. These are some examples from 2008. They're small, maybe five inches on the side. I think the one on the left is five by seven. It's not very good, you know? But I wasn't, uh, I didn't worry about that. The idea that I could just get up and paint something else tomorrow was really free. And so after about two years of doing daily painting, I start to see glimmers of things that look like my current work. I'm still painting pretty small here. This is now a few years in, six by six inches, eight by eight inches. These are all painted from life. I don't work from photos at all. So I set this stuff up and looked at it. And over the years, I got comfortable painting a little bit larger. And how did I decide what to paint? You know, how do you, how do you find something new to get inspired by if you're gonna paint every day of the year? I just looked at what other people did and I tried the things that looked interesting. Honestly, and the things I enjoyed, I did more of, and the things that didn't work out so well, I didn't do more of. So after a few years, my paintings got a little bit larger. I wasn't doing really daily painting anymore. It was just kind of like I would paint a little bit as often as I could. Maybe I would turn out a few a week. And I started having shows around this time. And then people started asking me, well, do you teach? And I would say, well, no, why do you ask? <laughs> and they asked me often enough that I started thinking I should try to teach. And so around this time, I did start to teach workshops. And I found out that I really loved teaching. You really don't know what you have until you tell it to somebody else. So I encourage all of you, go find someone who hasn't taken an oil painting workshop and show them what you learned this week. You'll cement it in your mind forever. We're coming up to some much more recent work. I've been telling my students all week, it's good luck to eat your still life. It's good luck to eat your still life. This was the painting where I found that out. <laughs> to joke that by the time I'm in my 70s and 80s, I'll be real comfortable painting a mural. <laughs> I think it's true. Here's a near plein air looking out a window. You might notice I'm kind of an indoorsy painter. This is an actual plein air painting that I did standing in the actual outdoors. Oh my goodness. But you can always get me to go outside when there's a model involved. I still paint portraits, figure, I go to a lot of life drawing sessions. Those of you who follow me on Instagram have seen my drawings of Mama. So here's coming up toward more current work. 2017. putting them through the paces, I started doing things like black and white value studies. And I started thinking about <laughs> composition in a more rigorous and academic way. Whereas when I started doing daily painting 10 years ago, I just threw everything at the wall and saw what stuck. Sometimes I got a good composition, sometimes I didn't. I didn't always know either way, and I didn't really care. I just wanted to have a good time painting and kind of like what I came up with. But I started planning things in a more rigorous and careful fashion black and white oil study next to the finished color painting. It probably would have been about half the size of the finish, which was 12 by 12 inches. It's another kind of preparatory sketch. Sharpie and white marker on toned tan paper. I shop at a lot of thrift stores. You might, and you might notice recurring themes in my work. I paint the same things over and over again. I have real relationships with these objects sometimes, you know. I lost a box when I was moving last year and I was very, very sad, even though nothing in there was probably worth more than 10 bucks. It's a piece from earlier this year. That's a pretty recent one. So yeah, this is some of the work by my online mentees. I give them 
a challenge, a suggestion every month, something they might think about exploring. A few months back we did shoes. These are just some of their pieces. We have a Facebook group page where they can hang out together. And a lot of the ways that I work with them have been digital. I've been the most surprised. I put my toe in the water of digital art about a year ago. I got an iPad, I got the Procreate app, and I started doing digital critiques. So a student would send me a reference photo and their block in, and I would say instead of giving them six typed paragraphs on my suggestions, I just take it into digital, procreate, program on the iPad, make the changes, write a few notes, send it back, and then they make the corrections. Works out pretty well for everybody. And so since I've been using the iPad, it's actually affected my own work in unexpected ways. I went from doing those value studies I showed you earlier in either oil paint or pen to doing them digitally. And the bonus is you get this fun time-lapse video along with it, which looks great on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. Digital painting, iPad, Apple Pencil. From life, though, you know, not from a photo. Okay, and I also use it to plan color paintings. The bottom image is the actual painting. The middle image is a color study, and the top one is a black and white value study, but the top and the middle image are digital paintings. The bottom is real. It really helps me make decisions like how I'm going to handle transitions across the negative space. This is a big area of canvas. I don't want to be experimenting on the canvas. Real easy to make changes. Sorry if my voice is a little raspy. I've been talking, talking all day, all week. So what have we been up to this week? <laughs> my students on Tuesday morning walked into a nice, clean, orderly environment that looks something like this, and we transformed it very rapidly into painting Palooza. <laughs> We've been having a lot of fun. My workshop philosophy is kind of, uh, you're not gonna take home a finished masterpiece to hang over the, the fireplace, but you will practice a lot of starts. I think we all know how to finish a painting, overwork it, kill it, beat it to death, but how many of us practice starting effectively? And that's what we've been up to this week. We walked through my process, black and white thumbnail sketch, black and white value study, underpainting on the canvas and then into color. And here are my actual current students working away. Here you can see my student looking at his value study while he blocks in his underpainting. I have 17 painters up there. This is just a sample of their work. It's a beautiful space. I really like the studio. And I am impressed and honored by the level of passion and talent. The group that I am getting to be with this week. I'm super happy to be here. Thank you very much. Columbus Cultural Arts Center for having me. Um, I think we should bring the next speaker up right away. So, um, Bethany James, who was down in the jewelry studio, is going to come up and tell us about the work that we're doing. So, as Eric, can you all hear me? It's been a long time since I've talked into him. Um, so, as Eric said, I actually am from Columbus. I um, was born in Marion, Ohio, which is about an hour north. Um, that's where my mom still lives. And once I went to college, I... Oh. <coughs> well, there I 
Um, so once I went to college, I um, moved to Columbus and lived here for six years. And then in November, I just moved to Cincinnati. So I don't know much. Um, still learning the area. Everyone keeps asking me questions about where do you teach down there? Where are you selling your work? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm still learning. Um, I am definitely more um, familiar with Columbus for sure and I always come back here and here at least once a week because I can't get enough of it. <laughs> so I do make that hour and a half drive all the time. Um, but okay, so again, um, my name is Bethany James. Um, this is one of the necklaces that I sell in my studio production work. Um, so here is my two beautiful puppies. Um, so on the right here is Flynn, and then we just got a German Shepherd puppy about two months ago, so she's quite the handful. Um, her name's Roxy, and then um, at the bottom picture, we, uh, when we moved to Cincinnati, we bought our house. Um, so that is my partner Jeremy there. So um, when I went to college, I chose to go to Columbus College of Art and Design. Um, hey. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, small art school feel. I applied to a few state schools and saw that they were just too big. Um, I wanted to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one with the instructor and have all of the materials around me. I love their facilities there too. Um, so my, I think I'm one of the few that actually went in with a fine arts major and stuck with it for four years. Um, most people don't do that. They kind of switch around. But I was all in for four years, so I got a fine art major and focused in sculpture and metalsmithing there. Um, and metalsmithing is jewelry. Um, they kind of combine the two together, so they'll do welding and small-scale metals. Um, and when I was there, I really took on the job and the responsibility of revamping their whole studio. So I worked there every summer, um, made a tool room, we expanded the studio a lot, um, brought in more torches, all the benches have flex shafts. Um, here we actually borrowed the flex shafts from CCAD so we could all have our own flex shafts this week. Um, it just helps a lot, makes it go a lot faster. So I um, loved my time at CCAD, um, fell in love with the environment, the craft community, um, still have very close friends. Um, and that is where I met Mary Screnta. So when I was getting my BFA, um, she was getting her MFA, and Mary Screnta is the one that run, does she run the jewelry department? Kind of, is a lead yes. teacher, yes, okay, here. Um, and she also runs the jewelry department at CCAD now. Um, so we became close friends when we were in school and still work together quite a bit. Um, so that's what brought me here um, to teach a workshop to, um, this week. So after I, well actually when I was still in college, I um, was the intern for the Smithery. Has anyone ever heard of the Smithery in Grandview? Yes, it's where we're having our trunk show tomorrow with Mark, me and Mark. Um, the Smithery is run by two metal smiths, um, females. And they took me on as an intern, and I worked for them for a year. Um, that's where I really fell in love with the art jewelry scene. After that, I, um, when I was a senior in college, started working for the diamond seller, and that's where I learned all of my fine jewelry setting techniques. And then I launched my own brand called Leo Goods in 2017. So these are pictures from my thesis exhibition in college. I just graduated um, three years ago. So I'm still kind of fresh out. Um, here we have work that was made all out of silicone and flesh tones, and then it was set into metal. So I did a lot of conceptual work in school about the body um, and how imperfections of the body and imperfections of the artwork are more valuable than what um, is actually being set in there. Um, so I believed that the imperfections of the work was more valuable than if a diamond was put into jewelry. Um, so that was kind of started in the 50s and 60s. It really got popular, and then I um, expanded on that with my own work. So here is a brooch 
That whole white piece is silicone and it is drawn with graphite all of the stones that would be set in um, instead of actually setting the stones into metal. Here, um, I was tackling the concept of bigger the better. So this is a pearl necklace that is 20 feet long and dipped in silicone. Um, I wanted to make the statement of the bigger the diamond ring, the more value you have on that, um, which isn't necessarily true, of course. So I wanted to portray that the sentimental value of your grandmother's pearl necklace is way more valuable to a human being than how much it costs. So that's really what I was working on in college. Um, there it is a cotton necklace, and the ends are soaked in silicone, so it made like a really funky, weird texture. Um, a lot of people didn't like to touch it because it was so weird. It kind of freaked them out. Um, and then a brooch on the other side with lots of little divots in there as texture as well. So, um, my junior year of college, uh, the diamond seller put on a competition, and so I submitted this design um, to them into their ring design competition, and I was chosen for them to supply the materials and the mentorship for me to fabricate this um, and set all the stones. So here we have mutilated quartz on the left-hand side with diamonds, and then that dome spins around, and then that's what the, on the sapphire side, where that metal piece is, is on the other side of it. So the whole dome spun and clicked into place. Um, so I won this competition to make this ring. They paid for it. It was more of like a scholarship, and all I had to do was donate my time. Um, and then I sold this ring in a very large collection of work that I made at their big gala event that they have every year in December and was able to keep the money that I made. <laughs> awesome for a college student. <laughs> Any way possible, right? Um, so that is how I got introduced to the diamond seller and the fine jewelry world. So at CCAD, they didn't teach a lot about fine jewelry. They taught a lot about conceptual work, wearables on the body, but not necessarily how to technically set diamonds. So I got a job at the diamond seller. <laughs> My senior year of college, I started part-time. They trained me as a bench jeweler. I started with repairs. Um, that's kind of how you get to mess up and learn and do all that. You get to size rings. I got used to working with gold, which was very different from silver or brass or copper. Um, so, I started with repairs, and then once I graduated, I started full-time 40 hours a week, and then started doing diamond setting. So, they worked me all the way up to princess cuts. Um, start with rounds, and then you go to all your corners. So then you go to pairs, which have one corner there. That was my first pair. It was also my first custom piece. Um, so six months in, I started doing custom designs for customers. So I got brought up on the floor. Um, you sit down with the customer and design these rings. This one was a happy accident. No one else was there. It was only me, and I was the one that was able to draw. So I went up. <laughs> and was able to fabricate and make this for them. And my students this week know that that is not easy. <laughs> um, here is a three stone band, and then there are, there are diamonds set on the bridge here, and then all the way on the sides. And then this was another custom piece with a halo. And then a split shank here, so this is all wrapped in tiny, tiny diamonds. And then the center stone is round with split prongs. And that was also another custom piece that I was able to do. And then after I started doing those, I was like, this isn't very creative. <laughs> kind of doing the same thing, setting all these tiny stones around this other stone, not getting a little bored here. So I started 
searching for custom pieces that were more sentimental to people. This one is a very special one that holds a good place in my heart. Um, this ring here was this woman's mother's ring, her diamond ring, and she had just recently passed away. Um, so the woman came in, brought the ring in with her, and we sat down and discussed how to make a piece from it. So her biggest thing was, I don't want just the diamond to be the only part in the pendant. She wanted the whole band. Most jewelers would turn her away and say, we can't do that. I did not. I was like, challenge accepted. So I took her band, and that is the part that completes the pendant here, because that is the metal that she actually wore on her finger, which is very sentimental. Um, and then I made these bezels for her diamonds there, and set her stone, set all the stones into a pendant, and now she wears it every day. So that was a lot more satisfying than just production diamond setting, um, and kind of made my creative brain a little bit at ease. Um, after that, I was really trying to push my skills. So on my own, I searched out ways to fabricate things because in fine jewelry stores, everything is cast. So it's built into a computer and then they ship it out. And then you get it back and it's this beautiful shiny thing and all you have to do is lay in those diamonds. That was very fun for me. Um, so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make a solid band, and I'm going to carve it out myself. So this is a French cut here, and so it has teeny tiny little points there in between all of the prongs, which we will be doing a demo on tomorrow. <laughs> here I learned how to fabricate a band, and Pave has set three stone diamonds. Now these diamonds look very large on this projector, but as my ladies know in my workshop, they are about one millimeter wide. So they are teeny tiny and they go flying everywhere. <laughs> we have lots of CZs down there if anyone needs something. So, <laughs> so from the diamond seller, um, about two years in, I was like, okay, how am I gonna get this creative brain going? So I combined what I learned at CCAD um, with my conceptual work, all of those background ideas, and my fine jewelry techniques into what my studio production work is now. So here I, I etch with a graver all of these fine lines into the metal, and I love when I slip or they're not straight because that is human nature. You cannot make a straight line into metal. Um, it looks handmade, it looks fabricated, and so I totally embrace that. Um, and then we'll oxidize it, polish it, do all the finishing techniques. Here, this one, there's stones set in each one of these links on either side. Um, you wouldn't know it from looking right on top, but as soon as someone wears it around their neck, you see all of those sapphires that are set on the ends. And then, of course, the four prompt setting there, that's just a normal setting. So I was trying to figure out what my studio production jewelry, what the look was. Um, how was I going to combine those fine jewelry techniques from the diamond seller in with the stuff that I learned at CCAD? And so here is a bigger necklace, um, and I articulated the silver. So I was really focusing on material experimentation. How could I manipulate this metal into um, having perfections on its own without me having to do anything? So I focused in on the material imperfection as well as the human imperfection of me making those marks and then combine them together. So here is all material imperfection. Um, you get those little melted lines. Um, I know if you guys don't know a lot about metal, you're like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. But um, it gets a lot of texture, and then I am able to form it into a necklace. Here you can see it a little bit better there. So 
focusing on just the material manipulation and not the and then those are all of my lines there. So I love how it's all imperfected. And then I add accent stones and combine those two together. I'm currently working on doing more formed work. A lot of my work right now is all flat. Um, so we're going to do those lines and imperfections while it's flat, and then now I'm going to curve it. I also, and I've said this multiple times for many things in our week um, this week, that when I do something, I'm going to do it and then apply it in three different ways. If I'm going to buy a necklace for somebody or for myself, I'm going to want to wear it either with different outfits, I'm going to want to wear it different ways, um, just because if you're going to put money into something, I don't want you to be able to only use it for one use. So here, this is a necklace, and then there's a brooch connection that folds down. So you can't see it as a necklace, but then you pop the brooch up and put it through your shirt, and the chain hangs down. So that's more of a conceptual piece. Um, it's currently at the Smithery on display at their show called Luminous. Here, this is like a really big circle um, that sits right in the middle of your belly. Um, with all of those lines and imperfections there. And those are all done with gravers. And my ladies back there are like, oh my gosh. <laughs> we did graver work today, so they know how hard it is. So, um, from that work, I was really experimenting while I was still at the diamond cellar, so I still had that income base there. Um, and then I was like, okay, I've got to go do shows. So I signed up for a lot of shows, um, apply, 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 of course. And once you do, um, I had them lined up four in a row, November through December. So I set a date for myself. I have to quit my job at this date so I can do these four consecutive shows. And this was just last November. Um, so I was looking and looking and looking and then my partner actually got a promotion um, with Kroger and then that moved us to Cincinnati. Um, so my plan kind of went out the window. <laughs> we moved cities and um, I was able to quit my job and do Winter Fair, which was my sh first show last year, um, which was awesome. So I made the displays, did all of that, um, and won an award, which was awesome. Yeah, first show, win an award, that's not real. <laughs> and then um, I kept applying, 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 and now I have done 18 shows since November. Um, it's been a lot. <laughs> so I have, I usually line them up from weekend, 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 and then take a break to make more studio work and then keep on going. So I have one next weekend. I was just talking to Eric last night. If I don't make work this week, I'm going to be behind. <laughs> um, yes, I brought my studio to my apartment this week as well. Yes. Um, I am very driven. <laughs> um, but here I was at the Columbus Arts Festival um, just a couple weeks ago, so that was my biggest show that I've ever done um, and plan to do many more. I then went to Worthington and then now I'm here. Um, so this is kind of a little taste of what I was talking about before where now I'm starting to form all of my line work um, into forms and shapes just like that there. So I compared my conceptual work with my fine jewelry work and now have a studio production line um, that people are willing to wear, but love that it's funky, still classic in style, not too weird. Um, so yeah. This is my question slide. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for me? from, um, it's a tribute to my grandmother. We were both born in August, and that is our zodiac sign. Um, 
we always celebrated our birthdays together. We were like one day apart. Um, so it was a tribute to her. I also, this is going to be kind of bad, but artists have to walk through hoops. I also had a non-compete when I was at the Diamond Cellar. So I could not connect my name to my work. So I had to loop around that, um, come up with a business name, and I chose that one. Um, so it wouldn't be connected to my personal name at all, but was still able to um, have something that I loved and could kind of carry on as well. I also kept it pretty general because what happens if I don't want to make jewelry anymore? Um, I wouldn't have to change my name. Um, or if I wanted to open a storefront and do consignment deals and different things, bringing ceramics and different craft objects, I would be able to. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm going to give you five minutes now. All right. Well, certainly, but certainly not least, but indeed last. <laughs> Not at least to a cleaner like myself. I've been watching this guy's work for years, and we reached out to him to teach a workshop, and here he is from North Carolina. North Carolina. Although he's Pittsburgh born and raised, so he's got that Steeler blood in him. But. All right, well, Mark Arnold is going to tell us all about himself and his work. Thank you, sir. I don't know. Is that too close? No, no, it's good. good. Alright, um, my big, I was telling them in my workshop, my biggest fears in life is public speaking and getting my shoelace stuck in an escalator. Um, yeah, I don't have shoelaces and I don't see an escalator, but this microphone probably kind of helps towards that. Um, so I'm Mark Arnold, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, yes. Um, so as you see, all of my work is based on Pittsburgh. I can't really help it. I'm what they call a Super Bowl baby. Um, the Pittsburgh Steelers won a Super Bowl, and nine months later, I was born. <laughs> <laughs> um, so growing up, I like grew up right outside of the city. All my family worked in the steel mills, the railroad, and this is just what my daily life looked like. This is my parents' backyard, so you would just see the steel mill. And it was just a really big influence on like visually younger, and then I try to incorporate it in my work now. Like most of my family, I thought I was gonna get a job in the mills or working on the railroad. And I went to school for computerized machine technology. When I was in high school, I did an assistantship or yeah, an assistantship program, and I was working for pit tool and die, and we were making plastic injection molds for play, Tyco and Play School. So these were the tools that I was using and machines we were working on. And then my aunt was the high school secretary and she made the mistake of telling me my senior year, all I had to take was an English class. <laughs> so <laughs> I did the most rational thing. I dropped out of a program. I went to school one day a week or one hour a day and then I rode BMX bikes the rest of the time. Um, so this was about 12 years and 50 pounds ago. Um, so me and my friends would build these jumps in the woods out of clay. I didn't have much of an art background, I just was in the woods. Um, these were, that's like panned out of the jumps we were building. All hand built with shovels. Um, and it, whenever I got into ceramics, it really, ceramics drew me in because you need a community. Like ceramics, everyone's helping and teaching each other. When you're firing kilns, you have people helping you with the kilns. And at our trails, you have groups of people that were dedicated to doing it. So it's just very similar. And we're using clay at the same time. Um, but when I was about 27, I had 10 years ago last week an injury that kept me on crutches for a year. And I realized, realized I needed to go back to school. So I went back to community college and I studied ceramics under Jerry Dennis. So for a year, I tried to avoid um, taking a pottery class. I just did not want to do it. I was taking printmaking, graphic design. 
And then my, I met my wife and her father, my father-in-law, as a potter. And I went into his studio and he got me hooked. Um, I show Jared's work because there's a lot of repetition and I see it in my work now. And then Joseph Delphia, he was also a studio tech at the school. And what's funny is his parents take classes here, Michael and Elizabeth. And they took one of my workshops last summer in North Carolina, so just full circle. Someone really got me interested in clay for his parents to take a class. Um, so my wife and I transferred from community college to Edinburgh University. It's just outside of Lake Erie in Pennsylvania. And if you've ever been there, it looks like this probably nine months of the year. <laughs> it's just snowy. Um, it's pretty normal to wake up and go outside and there's just four feet of snow from overnight. But it meant that you had a lot of undistracted studio time. You just got to work in the studio. There was no distraction outside of school. Uh, while I was there, I got to study with Lee Retro, Chuck Johnson, and Linda Cordell. And it was just really nice to have um, such a wide variety of people with different points in their career making different types of pottery, sculpture, um, just really pushed me. So at the end of the four years, these were the pots I was making. Um, I wasn't really sure what I was doing. Everything was really intuitive. Um, and I knew that if I went to graduate school, it would give me three more years to conceptually figure out the ideas behind my work. So at this point, my wife and I were both at Edinburgh University for undergrad. She's went to, she got her BFA in jewelry and metalsmithing and a degree in art ed. And then we both got accepted in the Southern Illinois University of Edwardsville. It's about 20 minutes outside of St. Louis. And it was a commuter campus, so once you got the campus, it was a lot like Edinburgh, there weren't many distractions. It was nice you can go and walk out in the woods, but it's not like, like you couldn't just like walk out and go to a bar and be distracted to leave. You were just, it was a commitment to be at school. So while I was there studying on the Paul saying, um, the piece of, like on the bottom left and top right, that's porcelain to look like, that looks like leather. Like, um, he has pieces of those in the Smithsonian. But then that's his potter on the bottom right. He's one of the most prolific potters I've ever met. And I think his work ethic just definitely like rubbed off on me that I need to be in the studio all the time. And then first year professor when I was there, Joe Page, and he was about six months older than I was. So it was really interesting to have someone their first year of teaching highly conceptual art. Um, is there a laser pointer? Yeah. So there's a little cloud there. Wow, I'm shaking. Um, and there's a clay cloud inside. So he's a ceramic artist, but that's all of the clay he uses. It's like when he installs those shows. So it's nice to have someone with an outside aspect thinking about the pot I was making. Um, while I was at school, I got introduced, like in graduate school, I introduced some painters. And Wayne T. Teagle is a painter that I just love how he flattens the surfaces. But I think part of like the flatness of it really reminds me of Pittsburgh. Like seeing the photos of it and um, just the way that the incline comes down, it just, um, it just really drew to me. So that's why a lot of my surfaces are kind of flattened. Um, and this is when I started experimenting with screen printing on my pot. So I was printing images that I was taking from around Pittsburgh when I'd go home for the holidays and screen print them on my pots. So these are some of the bridges. Um, these are the bridges kind of set in a pattern and abstract them a bit. And this is probably the first piece I was doing that's a little more architectural. But I, just because like Pittsburgh was important to me, I knew that like I talk about it a lot, I'd probably say the word too many times. You could have taken that on over and under. Probably not how many times I'd say it. Um, but I wanted to find a way that it interested me, but you didn't look at it and it just called to the city. Um, and it's a lot like my favorite painter, so this is um, Richard Diebenkorn. In his older work, you could see the figures, you could see the objects in it. And then when he moved in this Ocean Park series, he focused on color plane paintings. So that's when I really started taking that, um, focusing in on certain areas of the city and just using it as color fields. And this was the first piece that came about from that. Um, it, I also switched from porcelain to terracotta at the time. And it, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I feel like I'm echoing. Like, it's just like, yeah. alright. Um, but there's something about the shiny surface that didn't relate to the city. 
I was really used to riding my bike around the city. And everything was worn down, um, matte, like it was not shiny. And that's when I switched into the surfaces I'm using now, the Terrace of Lava, it's like a matte glaze finish. Um, and then this kind of leads into my thesis show, which was called Hometown Perspectives. So during my show, I was just taking my idea of the city, whether you were in the city, and just like encapsulated by the buildings, you were at my parents' house, you could see the skyline, or if you were like on Mount Washington looking down on the city. So all the work was based off of those three perspectives. So I was building some shelving units to stack the pieces to look like the, to reference the houses on the hill. Um, also growing up by falling water, I was building some shelving units that would reference the horizontal lines from Frank Lloyd Wright <coughs> and just the nature of like, like the wood, like natural aspects of his architecture. Um, playing with the idea that Pittsburgh's surrounded by bridges, so it's almost be like a container, like the bridges are. So when I build tray, different tray sets, like on the bottom right, I'm thinking of that being the city holding the city, or the bridges holding the cityscape in. Um, or using the bridges, the stacking of cargo containers for um, the form and for the patterns and for the color palette. Um, so these are just a lot of like the inspiration for the photos that I have and like what I'm drawing from. So if you see my work, a lot of this checker pattern that's where it, what it's inspired by, and how I could stack cups to create the patterns or make trays to reference the barges pulling the cargo containers. I also found beauty and imperfection. I love when you buy a sheet of plywood and there's the little football shaped biscuits that they use to cover the imperfections. So for a while I was putting spring mold of pressing clay to cover up imperfections in the piece while I was making it. And that's what that little square is on the right. Um, here's a few pieces from my thesis show. It's just kind of like an overview of the gallery. And then a couple close-ups. So this was the only like sculptural piece that I really did. And it was based off of a cityscape being reflected into the water. And then it's all like weathered, so like just showing like the history of the city and just how it gets worn down over time. Um, these were a series of vases that I staggered in the same way on the pedestals. And there's 16 larger platters that were made with the same process we've been working with in my workshop. And just like thinking of being in the city, how different things sit in front of each other. Down here on the bottom right, that that was a voodoo doll. And when I installed the show, I didn't want to touch it. It was just there when I got into the gallery. <laughs> and it stayed there through the opening reception. I was scared that it would like curse the platters and fall on the floor. Um, so one of the best parts about it was. So that's my wife on the right, and we both had our thesis opening the same night. So we got to have family there and just experience it together. But then what else? It was really cool too, because some of my good friends drove from all around the country to support me, so it just reminded me of the clay community and just the family that um, comes apart with ceramics. So after I graduated graduate school, both my wife and I, she got her MFA, I got in metals and models and ceramics. We both got accepted to a residency at Pocosin School, Pocosin Art School of Fine Craft. It's in Columbia, North Carolina, with a population of 800 people. So again, there were no distractions. Was, um, <laughs> I'm feeling like I just set myself up not to have distractions. So I think that helps my work ethic. Um, but it was really nice. I got to assist a lot of artists in the um, as I started teaching workshops, people I admired I was their assistants and I could see different things in workshops that I thought that worked and how I could use that for me. Um, I also started letting not just Pittsburgh influence my work, but the surroundings around me. So this was the roof of the studio. So I started focusing, I started thinking the cityscapes, so I was thinking of smaller textures and patterns. Um, or just this was like a sewer drain right down the street. Um, and then how I can use some of those forms um, from whenever I was riding bikes to create the patterns within my functional pottery. Um, 
And now even when I go back to Pittsburgh, instead of focusing on the cityscape, I'm thinking of the well that seems on the bridges, the rust, and the textures, and how can I apply that to my work and get more texture and surface all around the piece. Um, since I don't have the facilities to make some large scale, a lot of the pieces I was doing for my show, and those don't really sell as much as a mug, since that's like my income now. Um, yeah, I've just been working on a lot of like smaller, one of a kind pieces. And I also switched to the brown clay after graduate school to reference the rust of the city and the bridges. And again, this is just how the form of the bridges can reference, like be an inspiration for the form of the piece. Um, and then these are just some like smaller scale, like little bug vases. So we were at the residency, we were supposed to be there until this past June, and then my wife got a middle school art teaching job. So we moved an hour north, and we bought our first house one year ago tomorrow, um, which meant I didn't have a studio. Um, we bought it with the intention, or, well, it's actually in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, which is that little dot on the right, about 45 minutes from the coast, 45 minutes south of Norfolk. Everyone always thinks it's like a great pottery state, but I'm four hours from that, I'm six hours from the mountains. So we're kind of secluded off to the coast. Um, yeah. <laughs> There's not many, but we're realizing from the time we load our car till we set up our beach chairs at the Outer Banks, it's 45 minutes. So it's, um, there's a few distractions. But <laughs> um, so this is my studio. On the top left, that's what it looked like when we bought the house. The bottom right is what it looked like a couple months ago. I had recently added a patio to the front. Um, I fully insulated it. So the top two photos are the before, the bottom or after. Um, I thought it was gonna take me about two months and it took about six. It was a pretty big process. Um, it's kind of cool to look back on it, but with no distractions, I'm also in the studio 12 hours a day by myself. I'm not in that community aspect. So it's been a pretty big transi transition in life. Um, and that's all. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Well, you tell them about, aren't you going to China for a Yes, yeah, so deal? next fall, not this fall coming up, the following fall, I'll be teaching with West Virginia University for three months in China. They're going to have me, they have a program where any college student can go and study for the semester. And they're going to send me, they say I'm teaching with, I'm kind of chaperoning the college students. <laughs> but they haven't met me, so they, I think the college students are going to be taking care of me. So it's all. <laughs>